Hi PJ. So first off, I would like to thank you for taking a portion of your time to making an interview with the 2100 News. Um, I want to ask you, you've been in, in, uh, in business and entrepreneurship for most of your life. Actually, you started with, with the first business experience in the early teen years. Do you believe it will be beneficial for the wider society to start teaching uh, entrepreneurship in uh, educational system and in early school system? Uh, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, I started my first business at nine years old. And, uh, you know, at that time, my family, uh, you know, w was not a rich family. Uh, and, and my parents would say, you know, if you, if you want to buy something, then you have to earn the money yourself. So I got a little bit creative and I picked up some stones on the beach and then I borrowed some uh, clear nail polish from my aunt and I put it on there and I turned it into jewelry. And that was like the first step. And eventually I learned it how to polish it the proper way and, you know, didn't use the nail polish. But in the beginning, I just took what was around me and figured out how to turn that into something that somebody would pay money for. And uh, it, it's been a, a great education for me. And uh, the other thing is um, my parents were very supportive. So once I got that thing started, I remember probably the best Christmas present that I ever had was um, a box of blank business cards and a rubber stamp. And it said Paul's Polished Pebbles on there and, and my name and address and everything and the phone number. And I stamped that on the cards and I had my business cards and I had stickers and and that was one of the, the best things that showed that I was in business and um, it really got me started and motivated and um, it, it was a good start. And I, I believe that children should start as young as possible and understand that, you know, money doesn't just come from nowhere. You, you have to earn it. Uh, you've been living in Asia for quite a while now and you actually have a business accelerator over there as well. Um, how does the uh, how does the making business in Asia differ from making business in in America? How does that mar market differentiate? Well, I think Americans are more open-minded. For instance, one of the things that I'm working on right now is to try to educate uh, Chinese and and other Asian markets about um, the fact that you don't necessarily need a physical office to work from. Um, that you can you can work from anywhere, and um, so um, you can you can work from anywhere. If you have a good connection, you can work from anywhere, um, and that's something that uh, many Chinese people don't understand. Right now, I'm looking to try to help many Chinese companies who uh, their staff has uh, maybe they can read and write English, but still not very good. I'm looking to have them hire virtual assistants in the Philippines that can not only help them, but can also work alternative hours so that uh, they can be communicating with their customers when the people in China are sleeping, but their customers are awake. Mm -hmm. And it's taken me a lot of time to try to educate them about that. I think that's one of the one of the main main differences. And uh, and also in China, everything is built around relationships. Uh, and it takes a very, very long time for people to trust you. You, you need to drink a lot of tea. <laughs> uh, in the past few years, we saw a blossoming of the crypto markets and cryptocurrencies. When did you first take interest in crypto? And what's the situation with crypto in Asian and Southeast markets? Well, my, my first interest was in 2010 when I heard about Bitcoin. Uh, I had to buy some right away. So I, I'm, I'm kind of like a, a conservative guy. So I thought I want to learn about Bitcoin. And over the next year, I'm really interested in learning about it. So I took $52, $1 for every week, and I invested it in Bitcoin. And I took my PayPal and I sent it to somebody who was selling it. And what happened is the transaction got stuck. The guy never received it. So I contacted PayPal and they said, oh, the transaction's on hold, hold for a fraud alert. Uh, anyway, after three days, PayPal returned my money and the 866 bitcoins that I bought for six cents were still, uh, you know, this, the guy still had them. And he said, well, we can solve it this way. You're in China. All you need to do is to go to Hong Kong and buy a Starbucks gift card and then give me the number and then I'll give you the bitcoins. And I hesitated because I thought, well, if PayPal thinks this is fraud, maybe it's really fraud and maybe I just shouldn't waste my time. So 
I never went to Starbucks to get the gift card, and I never got those 866 bitcoins, which in December was worth something like $15 million. So <laughs> anyway, that was my original interest. And uh, in the last like year and a half, I started getting interested in it again. And again, I'm, I'm kind of conservative, and I put some money in and bought a bunch of Bitcoin. And when, when it went three times, I sold out and took my money off the table. And I have some investments in other altcoins and things like that. But uh, it went actually 10 more times be, beyond that. <laughs> so I wish I had held on. And now I sort of have a different policy. When I put something in, I just put it in like, uh, you know, it's only money that I really can afford to lose. And... I just put it in and I'm going to sit on it for a long time. As we all know, the ICOs have become the most popular way for raising capital. Um, you've been involved with more than 150 companies so far. So congratulations for that. And did you, did you ever consider making maybe your own ICO? And where do you see the opportunities for the Asian markets? Well, it has been unbelievable. Way, way beyond my expectations. And I have helped a lot of people avoid fraudulent transactions because there's a lot of people in China that will, you know, give you a low price on a miner and then you send them Bitcoin. And now they may or may not eventually deliver, but a lot of people were playing in the Bitcoin mining, uh, you know, in investing in Bitcoin while they were waiting for the, the product to be built. Uh, so if Bitcoin went up, then they made a lot of money. If Bitcoin went down, then you might not get your, your mining equipment. So I, I've connected with people that I know and trust and I show up at their at their warehouses and and I video I do live videos and I show people, you know, if, if they're unfamiliar, I'll even make a trip there and say, here's your packages. They're being packed up and DHL is going to take them and here's the tracking number. Uh, and uh, I think it, it gives people a, a sense of security. And, and you know, uh, I, I built my reputation and I'm not going to sacrifice it, you know, uh, you know, for somebody to cheat somebody. So I, I, I'm kind of there as a as sort of a, uh, not really a middleman. I'm just trying to help people uh, because a lot of good comes from it. And uh, because of that, I've been involved in a lot of other, you know, things that people invite me to be a consultant on. Uh, I made a trip recently to uh, Philippines uh, to talk with an altcoin um, a development team here. Um, and I'm going to be helping them uh, do some things. I've also, in the, while I've been in the Philippines, I visited uh, hydro power plants and had meetings with the Department of Energy here, and they're very interested in cryptocurrency because they have surplus electric that's generated from this water, uh, and they also have geothermal that's mm -hmm. generated from the volcano, uh, you know, the underground heat that's generated from nearby volcanoes. So it's getting very interesting. Well, yes, China can China can be pretty scary because it, their government is pretty unpredictable on how are they going to regulate things. And actually, that brings us uh, to our next question. Uh, what's your view on the regulation? And tell me, which country do you believe that is making the most uh, for the crypto to get regulated? Well, I, I have definitely uh, thought about it, but I like to become an expert, uh, you know, about things before... Not, not that you get to know everything, but it's so early uh, in the beginning of this thing. I like to see other people make mistakes, and I, and I like to see things fail uh, and, and maybe help them get back together. For instance, one of the altcoins that I'm working with right now, uh, they did an ICO, and it was successful. And then the founders had a disagreement, and people were grabbing at money, uh, and it sort of it fell in value a lot. And then some time's gone by and the original developers of this thing are getting it back on track. And so I like to be involved with things where they may have stumbled and to help them get back on track. Uh, eventually, I'd like to do my own, but I think that there's a lot of legal aspects that are very dangerous. And if you're, if you're the first one out there, you're going to get a lot of arrows in your back, especially if you make some mistakes or, you know, and being in China, it's kind of scary because the government changes their mind all the time. And so I don't want to have any, any problems with any country where I am. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, I'm definitely think about, thinking about it for the future. But I think there's still plenty of time to think about it and to do it. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm always interested and I'm, I'm always being introduced to people and consulting with people. 
Um, and it's, it's brought me a lot of opportunities so far, and, and there's more coming too. Mm -hmm. Yes, we all hope so. And uh, we also hope that plenty more countries will follow that example. Um, and our, for our last question, uh, you're known, you said that uh, you're available for helping people uh, in, the, in this, the whole crypto community. And I wanted to ask you, what, what are you able to offer to these people who are going to be watching this interview in the future? And let's say they're from the US or from the European Union, what could you do for them uh, in the Asian markets? I think probably Singapore, uh, but but things change so often, so I'm not really on top of things, but I, I think there's a lot of things going on in Singapore, uh, and they know they need to embrace uh, something, so hopefully they will. Um, you know, I, again, I think it's really very early, but any countries that do embrace cryptocurrency, I think are going to attract a lot of new business. And I know some people in the Philippines related to the SEC, and there's some discussions going on that if the Philippines became a friendly country to cryptocurrency, it will probably do even better than what call centers have done for the country. And there's millions of people working in that industry because somebody was smart enough to come over here and use voice over IP technology and, and be able to take phone calls from the U.S. and around the world with good English-speaking people. So if they manage to make it a friendly environment for cryptocurrency, I think there will be amazing things that happen. And if not here, somewhere else. I think, you know, as far as, um, you know, we, we talked about education and, and entrepreneurship. And I think when, when people are in the, the regular education system, you're taught not to fail. Like failure is a terrible thing. And I think people, especially children, should not be taught that failure is a terrible thing. They should be ta taught that if they have a failure, they fall down, they get back up, they learn. Don't do that again, you know? And that's how you become a great business person is you try a lot of things and you see, see what works and see what doesn't work. And failure is not a bad thing. Some of my biggest failures turned out to be bigger successes after I kept tweaking them and listening to the customers and listening to the marketplace. So I think people need to get that word failure out of their head and not, not look at it as a failure, but maybe a setback yeah. and a time to regroup and get back up and move forward. PJ, thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you for your interview. Uh, we wish you a lot of success with your uh, businesses and we hope to speak with you soon. Well guys, thank you for watching. We just finished an interview with PJ. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I'm Giga Stifter, Squawk for 2100 News, and in the future we have prepared a lot of, a lot of good surprises for you. We're going to have a lot of interviews with very interesting influencers, and maybe if you have a special wish for somebody, you want to hear from somebody, uh, let me know, contact me, and we're going to try to get them on stand. Thank you very much.